Hi everyone, Rich Savell here, and in this video I want to go over with you the recently published guidelines for nutrition for the critically ill patient. As you can see here, these were published in Critical Care Medicine in February of 2016, and they were also published as part of the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. And I've tried to put together a few slides to emphasize some of the important points from this guideline. First, they've started a nutrition bundle, and I'd like to go over that with you here. First, they recommend assessing nutrition risk and to calculate energy and protein requirements, to initiate enteral nutrition within 24 to 48 hours of ICU admission, to take steps to reduce the risk of aspiration or improve tolerance to gastric feeding, and some of those are listed here, including prokinetic agents and chlorhexidine mouthwash. They, recommending, they recommend to implement feeding protocols in your intensive care unit. There's a real emphasis throughout these guidelines on not using gastric residual volumes as part of routine care, and to start parenteral nutrition early when enteral nutrition is not feasible or sufficient in high-risk patients. In terms of the nutritional assessment, they recommend that every patient who gets admitted to an intensive care unit have their nutritional risk uh, determined by these scoring systems, and examples are given here, the Nutrition Risk Score, NRS 2002, or the Nutrix Score, and that patients at high nutrition risk identify those most likely to benefit from early nutrition. They suggest not using traditional markers such as albumin and prealbumin as they are not validated in the ICU. They make a suggestion of indirect calorimetry and if you don't use that to use a predictive or simple weight-based equation of 25 to 30 kilocalories per kilogram per day. There was a real emphasis throughout of giving adequate protein, and as you can see here, 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram per day. They recommended that enteral nutrition be started within 24 to 48 hours in the critically ill patient who was unable to maintain volitional intake, and some of the reasons behind that are listed here. They suggest enteral over parenteral nutrition in critically ill patients who require nutritional support therapy, and importantly, they say that there is not evidence that uh, contractility, such as bowel sounds and flatus, needs to be present prior to initiating enteral nutrition in the critically ill patient. That you can start ICU nutrition in the stomach, and for those at high risk for aspiration, try to divert the level of the infusion lower in the GI tract, and to be cautious in giving enteral nutrition in those who are hypotensive or on pressors. Again, there was an emphasis on the provision of adequate protein, that in those who have ARDS, that you should start with either trophic or full nutrition. And if those are at high nutritional risk, there should be an attempt at getting the enteral nutrition with a target of 80% of the estimated goal within the first 48 to 72 hours. Again, it was key that they focused on trying to minimize NPO that gastric residual volumes should not be used as part of routine care, and that if they are used, to hold for a gastric residual of less than 500 really should be avoided. They recommended the use of prokinetic agents such as erythromycin and metoclopramide when appropriate to keep the head of the bed elevated, routine issues, chlorhexidine mouthwash, and importantly, not to routinely stop enteral nutrition if the patient has diarrhea. There was a real de-emphasis on specialty formulas, and you can see some other comments here regarding consideration for adding routine fermentable soluble fiber additive, and that if they are having diarrhea, consider giving small peptide formulations and commercial mixed fiber formulations. There was a discussion of the timing of parenteral nutrition. Again, it mattered more if the patient was high risk to start it earlier. There were some uh, somewhat confusing statements regarding probiotics, and the literature seems somewhat conflicted here. I thought it was interesting to give some guidelines to discontinue parenteral nutrition when the patient was receiving greater than 60% of their target energy from enteral nutrition. 
and that protein should not be restricted in renal failure patients. There were some general comments that were not particularly new about patients with severe acute pancreatitis to use enteral nutrition and that the feeding tube can be either gastric or jejunal. This seemed to be important about giving between 15 and 30 grams of protein per liter of lost exudate in patients with an open abdomen. Again, there were explicit comments made that in the post-operative surgical ICU patient to consider immune modulating formulas containing arginine and fish oils. As a practicing intensivist, this seems to go back and forth every few years as to whether or not this should be used, but I put it here as it was explicitly described in these guidelines. And in the chronically critically ill, there were comments about aggressive high protein enteral nutrition, resistance exercise should be used, and they concluded by pointing out the continuing controversy about nutrition in the end of life. So that's it for the slides. I think the important points here really are a continued emphasis on early enteral nutrition, that if parenteral nutrition is used, it should be used early if the patient is at high risk for malnutrition. There is a de-emphasis on specialty formulations and a focus in on making sure that the patient gets appropriate nutrition but does not receive excess nutrition um, and that a continued combined approach with intensivists working with registered dietitians to optimize the nutritional status of patients really remains the way to go. Thanks so much.